and try to get like stanch as well. I don't know what are we going to do. And um, somebody suggested, well, at the loop they have like a a little alert that you know, uh, uh, tells you you're you're too close. You know, back up a little. And this one guy who was with our he was one of our installers said, oh oh, if we do that, I want to be the voice. Step away from the blue boy. You are standing too close to the blue boy. Step away from the blue boy. That's, that's excellent. <laughs> I thought that would be so wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've always wanted, um, you know, there are those uh, fly traps that shoot say, uh, salt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. How are you? Welcome to the History Museum. Come on up. That's Kathy, it sounds like. Yeah, this is our speaker. Good evening. Oh, well, oh hi. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. That you all to explore the museum. But you've been here? Yes. Yes. Have, you, have you been here before? Yeah. Oh, okay. many, many times. Yeah. Oh, okay then. Oh, so, yeah. So. Well, my name's Ariel. I'm one of the guys. Hi, I'm Kathy. Oh, Kathy. I'm sorry. I can't raise my right arm. Oh, car okay. accident. That's perfectly fine. That, sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> Nice so, to meet you, ma'am. Thank you. I'm currently done. Thanks. Only four people are coming. Well, no, there's good. We got more. <laughs> Maybe only four people. I don't know. Well, I got 18 more shows. And we have about 15. Already. Well, 19, if you count that guy over there. Oh, that's me. Okay. Oh, we have some chairs. Okay. Oh, there's a picture. I want to see it. I want to um, yeah. um, I used to have cases if I can't find them. So, okay. Um, yeah. There you go. My, uh, first, my aunt Sharon, who lost her a couple of years ago, Alzheimer's. My uncle Ron. Died just two days ago, and my mom. Oh. Um, it, it was I found out it was sepsis. How do I do that? It was ninety-two, and um, the uh, doctor called the police up and said, "Oh, it's an abscess in the uterus, and it's in green, and it's part of the So uh, his wife, Allison, is having an autopsy done. Oh, yeah. that's a nightmare. Because he, you know, yes, he had sepsis, yes, he was 92, but other than that, he was perfectly fine. You know, I mean, they just, the, you don't, you drain it to me, you don't do something where it can scream. Yeah. Okay. In fact, when they, got, when they got in there, they kept telling him it was COVID, it was COVID. And they'd say, no, no, it's not. I have sepsis. I have sepsis. You know. Uh, Thomas, you had, uh, did you send me the bill already? Uh, no, it's, it's, you should have put, you should have done uh, the register. Did you do okay. uh, the first one you registered? Okay. So then you should have it in your email. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. It's obviously good. I'm going to be there. And I'm going to, you know, I used to never have to read anything. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
This meeting is being recorded. Oh, I also need to advance this so I can get to the photos. Yes, right. So I'll need to I'll need to minimize this. Right. <laughs> Whoops. I think I uh, somehow minimized all the meeting people. <laughs> okay. But I need to get this participants from the Okay, hold on a second, because I need to apparently, uh, I'm going to take a moment here and uh, Go ask people to mute their microphones. Um, Thanks. So okay, that's, what, that's, what, that's what I want. Okay, but just say, I want to make sure we're uh, able to. Can you get rid of that? I have no idea what's going on here. My Outlook windows, my Chrome windows, and I will. <laughs> if that's all I need to do, that that should be closed. Recent one. Oh, okay. Well, we should have uh, enough system resources now, uh, and it's still giving me that message. But I, I think we'll be okay. Well, I just want to make sure I have my slides. Yes, right. Now, what I need to do is go to the share screen again, <laughs> bring up your presentation, and then share it. Yes. Okay. That's so it. you're muted. That's why only my name is up. And then go to the slideshow. Can you make it so that it's just that? Yeah. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Okay, um, great. Before we get started, let me just add a couple of things to about because you, you need an introduction. You should be properly introduced, Kathy. Kathy, I met just a few years ago when she was doing work on the book that I was just about to tell you about uh, when I realized I hadn't been recording. And uh, now that we're recording, Kathy is the author of At Home in the World, which is the study of 20th century feminist environmentalists, fe female environmentalists. Um, maybe they weren't all feminists, but they were definitely female, and they were. Um, she is uh, uh, specializes in uh, U.S. history and in general women's history in particular, and uh, she is because of that interest. Uh, I realized there was an intersection between our history center and the fact that we own the Dalladay Adobe, and there's an untold story about the Dalladay. And the daughters of the Delavity, in particular, the most interesting of the three daughters who survived to adulthood, which you're going to hear about today. And four sons. Four sons, one of whom murdered one of the other. So that's the story we usually tell when we're at the Dalladay. And of course, it's very, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, right? That's uh, unfortunately uh, the only thing a lot of people remember about the, the, the family of the Dalladay. They also will remember the setting because it's such a beautiful place to be. Uh, but this is thanks for Dave Hanning. Yeah, it, it's Dave Hanning's is here as well, our volunteer gardener who manages the, the all the plantings in particular, the vegetables, flowers, and some of the fruit trees at the Dalladay. Um, and yeah, Dave, uh, you can you can say hi. They won't see you, but you can say hi. He, he did say hi. <laughs> but I hope everybody can hear all right. Um, I'm going to ask you though to mute your own microphones until um, the end of the presentation, and we will then make sure that you will have a chance to ask as many questions of Kathy about the Dalladay family, and in particular about Sen. She's studied all of them, but she's focused on Sen Dalladay and the artwork. I want to also call your attention to the fact that yeah. here we have a couple of yes. prints of her artwork, so Same. you can close a little bit better what her artwork would look like. And we do own those originals. They are stored here, but we're not, we're not, we don't have the conditions right now, especially with this humidity, I think, to display them. So without further ado, Kathy Cairns. Um, Thank you. Let's go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so this is Kenna Dow. Uh, this photo was taken when she was about 14 years old. And as you can see here, she was the oldest daughter of Pierre and Asensio Dalladay and the most prominent and successful. And that's really, the, I think, one of the most interesting aspects of her. She's phenomenally interesting. Um, 
There were seven, nine children born to the family. Um, seven survived to adulthood, four boys, three girls. And she was the most successful. Um, there are so many interesting things, but one of the most interesting things I found about her is that her family, her, her brothers were not at all resentful of her. No one was resentful of her. They, they embraced her, they celebrated her art and her life. So what I really want to do is to tell you, first of all, a little bit about her and place her in history, and, um, and then talk about her family. Um, her father was the most important person, most significant person in her life. Um, and then talk about her art and what her art says about her and about the time period that, that she lived in. So um, I'll start by talking about her. Um, uh, she was born, full name was Maria Asensio Galade, and Sen was her nickname, which I think is an amazing and wonderful nickname. Um, she was born in 1859, two years before the Civil War, uh, and she died in 1913, two years after women won the vote in California. Um, she seems on the surface to not have a very interesting life. Uh, first of all, she spent her entire life in the small town of San Luis Obispo, and it was small. Um, when she was born, San Luis Obispo had about 500 residents, and when she died, it had fewer than 3,000. So it was a very small town. She lived her almost her entire life um, in one place, and that was in her family's adobe, um, which I hope all of you will see at some point. It's an amazing, it's an amazing place. And um, it's a very small space. She shared that space with, uh, at some point, six, six siblings, and other times, two siblings. The end of her life, she only had two siblings that she shared it with. Um, her mother died when she was 14 at the age of, trying to guess, 30, 32, after, after giving birth to her ninth child. So every every 18 months to two years, she was having children. Um, she was so, um, She was married at 15. Married at 15. In history. So anyway, um, so she left no papers. She uh, there is virtually no public record of her life, which is not also not unusual for women at that time. Um, the only, the only um, public records were things like uh, a report card from a school that she attended when she was in her late, um, like early teens. Um, her father deeded all of his children, um, all six of his, um, six out of the seven, uh, deeded the exact same amount of property to the girls and to the boys, which I thought was really interesting. And he specifically said in his will that he wanted his daughters to have the exact same um, amount of property and money that his sons got. Um, there's a single four card. Um, there are a handful, a handful of letters, and I'll read you one or two of them, that were written to her in her life um, from friends who thought she was pretty amazing too. Um, the one thing that she left was amazing amounts of art. She There is so much art. Uh, there's a lot of it downstairs. Um, there's some of it apparently at the Jack House, which I've never been mm -hmm. to. Okay. There is some of it um, at the Dalladay Adobe, but she left a lot of art and she was quite versatile as an artist. She didn't just have one style, which you'll see later. So, um, so this is what makes her interesting on the surface. But one of the things, um, I learned being a women's historian for many years is that if you just look at people's lives, they seem to be simple. But for women at this particular point in history, um, women at this point in history were seen as living private lives where men were living public lives. And so they were in different spheres, basically. Um, the thing about Sen was that she basically combined those two sphere, spheres. She was devoted to her family. She loved her family. She she cared a lot about her friends, but she was passionate about passionate about her art. So so she combines those two spheres 
And uh, the life is much more complicated when you dig into it than it appears to be on the surface. So, so um, let me just start by talking about her family. And so I have to start with Pierre, her father. Here he is. Here we go. Was Dapper. <laughs> so Pierre was a, was a fascinating um, man. Uh, he was French, uh, Pierre Deladay. Uh, was French. He was born in 1823 in a small town in the southwest of France um, from a, to a relatively poor family. They didn't have any money. Um, he always had an outsized ambition, apparently, even from, even from youth. And um, timing, as historians always say, is everything. So 1823, he's born in a small town. It's the, the French Revolution ended a few years earlier. And it which sort of gave rise to something that came to be called the common man. Um, the U.S., of course, had the same thing with Andrew Jackson, and uh, who also, you know, uh, rose to be here you know, to be president, but he was very successful. Anyway, um, so what he did is the same thing that Andrew Jackson did um, to get himself in public. He joined the military. So uh, he's in the French military. He, he joins in about eight, 1845 or so, or 1844, 1845. And he is stationed in, wait for it, Tahiti. I mean, if you're going to be in the military, right? <laughs> so he stays in the military for five or six years. In the early 1850s, 50s, he musters out and he has to decide what he wants to do with his life. And so he decides to go to, uh, to the gold fields and to mine for gold and to become rich. So he sails into San Francisco Harbor and then he manages to find his way to Placerville. And uh, even at that particular point, um, he stands out. Uh, as one of his fellow miners says, Mr. D was a good liver. He insisted on taking a plentiful supply of food, unlike his companions who ate jerked beef. So he insisted that he not have, you know, that food. So um, he stays there for a few years, but American miners are not particularly kind to immigrants. And so um, he decides to move on in 1853. He decides to go south uh, to, to Mexico, which is having its own um, gold rush at that particular time. And on the way to Mexico, as fate would have it, uh, he meets Gabriel Salazar, who is an immigrant, um, also not an immigrant, he's a migrant from New Mexico. He came in the early, early 1840s here. From <clears throat> he make, not only makes friends with Salazar, but he marries Salazar's 15-year-old daughter. And within two years, they have a child, and you know, within 18 years, they've had nine children, two of whom died um, just after childbirth. So, um, so this is this is her father. Um, her father absolutely never, I should say, he never remarries. Um, none of the daughters married at all, and none of the three daughters married either. Uh, two of the four sons married. One of them was divorced. Only one had a marriage that lasted, and so I don't know if Milk says anything about Pierre, but um, but anyway, so so he never remarried. But it's clear from looking at photos and, and, and reading that he absolutely adored his children. And he was extraordinarily proud of them. Um, so how can we tell this? Well, um, are we going to be able to tell it? Oh, uh, I need to go back to the, OK. So this is the early 1870s, probably around the time that their mother died. Um, and taking your children to be photographed professionally was quite unusual at that point. Plus, it was really expensive. But he dressed up his children, or they dressed themselves, and they and they went to a professional photographer, and um, and they were photographed. Um, this is Pierre Jr. His oldest son, called Ipo, uh, mispronounced this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ipo Lee. Ipo Lee. Ipo Lee. Um, thank you, Thomas. Correct me. Um, Ipo. Uh, John is his third son, and Lewis is his um, is his second son. 
Uh, the, the youngest, Paul, was just a toddler and he wasn't in this photo. So, but it's pretty interesting if you look at these. Oops, um, that's perfect. That's fine. Uh, if you can compare a little bit, um, I want to go back for yeah. a second. I think you can by doing the left one. Oh, sure. Sorry. Um, see the, the boys, and you, sort of, you see Evo, and he looks, he's looking at the camera, but he's sort of skeptical. He looks a little bit skeptical. Um, compare that. Oops. I'm go back to, uh, if I clicked on it and missed somebody, I'd have to go back to the selection. Okay. So, oops. So, compare that to Stan. Stan is the oldest daughter there, and she looks pretty full of herself, pretty, pretty, pretty sure of herself. And the daughters all do to me. I mean, I, I'm just interpreting this, like, but, but she looks like she's not afraid of anybody, right? You know, cross Stan. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, um, yeah. so he takes me, so he has them all photographed. He also sends them to school, and I wasn't able to discover which what school they went to. Like, I guess it's probably the mission school. Um, but um, but Sin had a perfect report card in this place, perfect report card. She had no absences, no tardies, and she was first in her class. I found a report card for two of the boys, neither of whom were first in the class, <laughs> and neither of whom, or they, they both had targets. So, um, so anyway, uh, this, this is, this is, uh, uh, this, this is his family, uh, mine was Paul. Um, the next one is the early 20th, early 20th century. I just want to show this, because um, he, he continues to live with his children, um, his their entire lives, and um, so this is Pierre. This is next to Pierre is the youngest daughter Rose, and you'll get to meet her again a little bit later. Um, uh, the third person in is Sen, and the one on the right is Paul. So this is the early twentieth century. To get his money to survive. So um, so anyway, um, Some carpentry work. They live in the adobe, and, and you just saw the front of the adobe. I hope that how many of you have been to the actual adobe? Who oh, built? Right, right. In that adobe so, were yeah. um, mm -hmm. seven children and their father. So one of the other things I think is interesting that I discovered when I went there is that the girls had their own bedroom downstairs, and the boys slept in the attic. So anyway, I, I make it that way. <laughs> Will. Um, so anyway, uh, Pierre also helped his children financially and gave him a lot of money. And uh, he, I'll, I'll get to Sen. He really helped Sen a lot uh, financially with her art. But um, anyway, so he lent them money. Um, he, uh, I told you, he he, um, he made out his will. Is a plug in? And he gave all of his children the same, except for uh, both. Just wiggle the, I want to tell you the space it's not so good. Yeah, right. We have to turn them on. In, um, in helping them all get through life because uh, he and his oldest son had a falling out in 1897. If you look deeper into the history of the, of the Dalla days, this is one of the more interesting aspects of the family because they seem on the surface to be a perfect family for many years, um, but they weren't. So Ebo, uh, borrowed money from his father. He went into business. He failed at business. Um, it was during a time of recession in, in America in the 1880s and the early 1890s. And uh, he's very worried about money. And so he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not going to leave Epo any money at all. And so Epo is furious at this. And he comes unglued. And um, and so his younger brother, uh, John, who's the third son, is him for his father. And so um, Epo goes to get a gun, and John shoots him at the family home. You probably don't know the story. Who did he shoot? His younger brother. So he, so he shot his brother and killed him. Um, oh, shot John? Yes. Epo. One is that, um, that it's, it's Alder. Happens, but the other thing is it gets publicity as far away as Los Angeles. 
Um, all of the Los Angeles papers covered the story. Um, and uh, in the aftermath, John is acquitted uh, and, um, and he leaves the home. And so there are fewer, there's one, two fewer sons now, right? So, uh, and then a few years after this, Eliza Fine's yeah. daughter um, dies. Oh, so, so, uh, so Pierre is left with uh, four children, right? Four children, four children. So, okay, so this is this. These are three of the ones he has left. Well, let me just so, so this is the back the back story of Sin. Um, so let me just tell you um, about some of the forces that I I think shaped her, and I, I plan to do a lot more research on her. I just started research, research, researching her a couple of months ago. So I plan to do a lot more research on her, but this is what I've, what I've come up with so far. Um, she, since she was successful in a way that no other child in the family was, um, I sort of tried to put, put her into context with her family. Um, one thing I think that probably is very important is that her mother died when she was 14. Um, she would have been the oldest girl, and so she probably had to do a lot of the work, you know, raising the children, taking care of her siblings. But the other thing is that women had specific gender roles they were supposed to, well, white women, I should say, uh, specific gender roles they were supposed to play in the, ninth, the next 19th century. And since Sam went so far beyond those roles, although quietly and not not making any noise or attention, seeking attention. I, I, I sort of inferred that she was the person who uh, helped the father. Yeah, I guess they were with their wives. And um, first of all, and he didn't recognize the I think that she was trilingual. Trilingual. Her father um, was French. He never really learned to speak English very well, which is interesting because he became an American citizen. And I always wondered if he became an American citizen about speaking English very well. But he didn't know at the end of his life. Um, people who talked about him and wrote about him said he, he was very difficult to understand because he really couldn't speak English that well. So she must have, along with some of her older siblings, translated for him. Um, their mother was Spanish, and uh, and so she obviously spoke Spanish. Well, the younger kids would have been small, so it's the Spanish might not have stuck with them, but probably Ipo and and Sen spoke Spanish, and French as well as English. <laughs> it's pretty interesting and important. Um, so she probably also had a lot more freedom than other girls her age, because her mother wouldn't have been showing her how to cook and how to sew and how to do all these things because she, she was having children. Um, it seems quite clear from looking at the records that Pierre depended on her a lot in his business. Um, for example, one of the stories in the, in the Los Angeles Times, I think it was, about the murder of, of, um, of, uh, of Ipo, is that, um, that he was arguing before his murder with his father and his sister about business interests. Um, I thought, well, maybe it could be Rose, but Rose never seems to have been interested in any sort of business at all. She was really sort of a fun uh, person who had lots of friends and ran around and did lots of stuff. The other uh, girl, Eliza, was, had died by that time. So he must have been referring to um, Sam. So, so Sen helped her father in business. Uh, she kept records for him. She interceded for him. Um, she also controlled um, access to his properties. And he had more than one property. He had you know, many different uh, rentals around town. And she controlled access to that. And we know that because she had the key to a rental. And this is a very um, interesting story that I'm not going to go into. <laughs> Depth here, but it's quite an interesting story. She she um she had the key to a rental um, in which a man named Leon de Sesek moved into, 
Key to the rebel. Oh, this is good. Okay, I'm going to stop here. That's what you look like Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, actually, it does. So that's when I first saw that. I thought. So anyway, so Leonda's essay was okay. an anthropologist, and some of you know much more about this than I do, and I'm happy to talk about it after the talk. Um, he was a French um, uh, anthropologist, scientist, uh, who was involved with another Frenchman um, exploring the, the, new, the new world, the Americas, and taking back you know, scientific, um, uh, just like lots of different scientific exhibits. So he came to San, to San Luis Obispo in the 1870s um, to wait for his partner, who seemed to never appear. Um, he just waited and he waited and he waited there. And as, as he waited, he, uh, he met Sin because she controlled access to this property. Well, rumor has it that they had a romantic relationship, that they might have been engaged. Um, I, I, I couldn't really find in my uh, short um, time um, looking into this stuff, I, I couldn't find any evidence of this so much, except for the fact that, okay, his photo is of her family's, and her family's photos, right? He's here for four or five months. Why is he in, why are there several photos of him in the family papers? So he must <laughs> something to her or Pierre. But the other thing is, on the back of one of his photos, he writes, in French, but um, Thomas thankfully <laughs> translated. Um, to the person who has my heart, I give my life. Well, that's sort of a clue, right? Well, the upshot is that whatever relationship they had um, didn't last because he went back to France and she never saw him again. So, um, but he's pretty handsome. So, um, so anyway, so this is so this is sort of the the, um, the part of Sam that I think is really interesting. It tells tells you a little bit about her about her personality. It can't tell you everything, of course, because you have to make lots of inferences. Um, those of you who are historians, which most of you are, you have to make a lot of inferences when you're doing research. Um, so uh, let me just read a couple of things that other people said about her. So um, one letter. There are no letters in the files that she wrote to anyone, but a couple that people wrote to her. A very good speaker. Um, one of them says, I'm in a hurry to know whether you're dead or alive. What do you want? Dead, don't write. No lie. But if you're alive, let me know. <coughs> so clearly one of them had a sense of humor, but I'm guessing probably both of them did. Um, another one writes, mm -hmm. you know, I send of a planned visit to Slo. I expect to be there for a couple of months, and I shall not be paying calls or receiving many, but I would like very much to have you and your sister come to see me as often as you can spare. So she had a, a, a group of friends who really she was close to, and I just want to sort of, uh, as an aside, say here that just in looking at her life, it seems that San Luis Obispo was pretty welcoming in the 18, late 1800s to women, to young women, who were women who were uh, achieving. Um, for example, one of her closest friends is a woman named Helen Hayes, who is the daughter of the town's first doctor. Um, she's an artist and she's also a writer, wrote two books, published two books. Um, she's also friends with Ethel Jack, who's the youngest daughter of um, R.W. Jack, who is, you know, Jack House and, um, and also uh, the Jack Ranch and all that. And, um, and she's, her, another friend is named Jean Lind, whose family owns a stationery store and a framing, a framing store where her, her um, paintings are framed. So, so she has a, she's, she's a valued member of the community. She has a lot of friends. She has a lot of confidence because of what her the, 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 you know, the amount of, of responsibility that her father um, gives her. I presume that's true. So even her her family, um, Evo, who of course was murdered in the eighteen the eighteen nineties, um, sort of speaks to this. In eighteen eighty four, um, 
there is a there's a big folder of some of her artworks and um and he has in the back of one of them he writes these are thoroughbred berkshire pigs drawn from memory by our staff artist these are pigs december 30th 1884 9 30 p.m so um so so she is Honestly, she's a person I wish I'd known. So um, you don't often say that when you research people, you think, man, I would have known that person. But I, I really wish I would have known her because I'll bet she was a really interesting, um, uh, fun person. Um, in spring of, and I'm getting to her art now, so that's the third. Yeah, if I do that myself. Uh, no, I think I did that. Sorry. Perfectly fine. See, that's what happens when I go to admit somebody that uh, takes me off track. So there you go. So there it is. There it is. So anyway, um, so anyway, her father, you can tell how much her father thought of her as an artist because in 1894, he pays money to send her to San Francisco to art school. And um, she goes to the Mark Hopkins School of Fine Art, which I, and I have a slide in here of his mansion, which is unbelievable. Um, and he, it, it's, it's a school for young people who are considered to be aspiring, not just aspiring artists, but artists who might make something of themselves. And so she's admitted to the school and, um, and, she, and she stays there only for six months because her sister gets sick and dies. And so she has to come home. But it's interesting to surmise what, what could have happened to her if she'd stayed there for the whole five years that was the program because she might have become a really a noted artist. Another artist who was there um, who became friends with Sin, and she stayed the entire five years, and she and she did become a fairly well um, noted artist in California. So um, I should tell you that the mansion burned down um, in the 1906 earthquake. So it is now the Mark Hopkins Hotel, which no one can afford to stay in. Um, so anyway, so let me just move to her art. Um, and um, and just to tell you that she seems to, from the moment that she was born, she was doing art. I mean, she painted on virtually everything. If you go to the Adobe, um, it doesn't have many of her paintings there now. Um, they're being redone. I think they're going to take them back and hang them there. She painted on virtually every single surface. For example, if you walk in the door um, and you look on the wall, there are china plates. She painted on china plates. She painted little boxes um, that are jewelry boxes. Um, this is a trunk that sits in the living room that has silks and all kinds of stuff because you know here here this is quite um, you know, ambitious and wanted to make making really a lot of money, which she did for a long time. Um, so she painted this. One of my favorite things she painted is Pierre's bed. So um, this is, I, I don't think she carved it. Someone carved it. She painted all of that. Um, you can't see it very well, but if you go to the Adobe, you'll be able to see it better. But these are scenes from Tahiti that she painted um, in here um, on the bed. So there's just so much stuff there that she painted. Um, so let me just move on to some of her art. This is her first self-portrait um, that she did when she was young. There are two self-portraits that she did. Um, so she looks pretty confident, right? Um, she must have been looking in a mirror or something. I was trying to figure out how she would have painted this. She must have been looking in a mirror. No. No, how? She would uh, it, it, it stare into a mirror. That's why. You have this effect of her staring. Yeah, okay. Because there'd be a mirror here, and she would be looking in the mirror. Right. And then she would turn and take she saw them just turn back to the mirror. That's how self portraits were. Yeah. So this is when she was in her, she was probably 20, 21 when she painted this. This is the second one. So you can see how she changed over time. Um, this is when she was much older. Um, and you can see. I couldn't find any photos of her when she was older looking directly at the camera. She's also always sort of looking away when she's older, but her face is much thinner as she gets older. 
Um, so, but you can also see with these, some of the different types of painting she does. I mean, she has this, that, that one's paint, painted, and this one, of course, is um, sketch. She, um, she, she painted her sister Rose. Um, I should tell you a little bit about Rose. Um, there actually isn't much about Rose in the record, but Rose was Sen's lifelong companion. Um, they did everything together. She was five, six years younger than Rose. Um, and the only reason I know that this is, that this is Rose is because there is, Sen is Rose, <laughs> because she doesn't look much like Rose. Um, this is what Rose looked like when she was older. She looks like such a fun person, doesn't she? She looks like somebody that you would just have lunch with or, you know, whatever. She just is really, um, so Rose traveled with Sen. Um, they hung out together uh, all over San Luis Obispo. Um, I have another one for the end. Uh, but anyway, so, so this is Rose. Um, one of the interesting things about this, however, to me, and I couldn't find it, there may be some photos or some paintings. She painted no one else in the family. She only painted herself and Rose. So, I mean, there are some, if you go online, you can, and, and past perfect, the past perfect website, you can see some of the paintings, and, but there's not one of them says who the person is. And I couldn't, looking at the photos, none of them look like her other siblings. So that's, to me, that's interesting. Said something about her close relationship with Rose and possibly not so close with the rest of them. Okay, this is the mansion. Um, it was on Knob Hill, oh, you know where the, um, the Mark Hopkins Hopkins Hotel is. This is pretty extraordinary. Um, so yeah, and, he, and Pierre, rented her two rooms um, on the corner of Powell, I think, and I forgot what that one was. Um, oh, Mason. Mason, so she could go She could go there. So he rents her two rooms, pays for this, and so he clearly thinks that she's pretty talented. Um, so at this art school, and I included these because she, she doesn't paint very many men. She mostly paints women. And, um, but this is one of the people she painted at the art school. And of course, probably there are models there for, her, for the students to paint. And so it's pretty good, right? Um, so yeah, she, this is her, one of her art school paintings. And this is what she writes on the back of one of them. Art is rep as a representation of objects from life. It isn't life. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, this is another one of her drawings. And um, I don't, it's impossible to know whether she ever met Julia Morgan, but Julia Morgan went to this, to attended this art school at the same time she did. So, um, um, so let me move now to, to what I'm gonna focus on for the next few minutes. And that's the fact that she paints women. And um, she paints young girls with flowers, um, she paints, you know, young girls just sitting in chairs, but she seemed to be really interested in painting adult women and, and painting them in ways that are pretty sophisticated. So this is one, it's called Woman in Paint, that's the name of the photo. And um, are you guys impressed with this art? Yeah. This is amazing. And, and, she's, and she just lives her life in San Luis Obispo and she doesn't, and she, and in a way, it's sort of sad, but in a way, it's you know, she managed to still do her art. And that, this is called Woman and Shawl. So, um, so one of the things I was wondering as I was researching this and looking at this is why she focused so much on women. And then a few weeks ago, I remembered that I'd been in the Dalladay Adobe a few months ago, and I'd seen this big, thick book sitting on the shelf. They have, if you go in there, it's a big bookcase. And it's a big red book called The Woman. Well, it was published in, in 1900. So it would have been just about the right time for her to have looked at it or, or whatever. 
So, um, so one of the things that's fascinating about it is it has it, it, it's it's like a mini biography. It has little tiny essays about all these famous women in history. Um, it starts way back. It, Cleopatra, um, but then a, a number of the women are reformers, social reformers. Um, there is Lydia Maria Child, who is an anti-slave activist. Um, there is Susan B. Anthony, who you all know. Um, there are all these women who are involved in, in, in activities that are that you consider feminist, but you can't really consider or a feminist, I would argue, because the word wasn't in use at that time. But she clearly was interested in showing women, um, sophisticated women, interesting women, um, and but she didn't paint men very often, which I thought was pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so anyway, uh, like I said, I made lots of inferences. Maybe I'll discover other things that are different when I go back at it. So. Um, so anyway, she paints with other women as well. Um, I'll just I'll just go through these first and show you the one. Um, this apparently is the mission. Um, she, here in slow, she painted, and of course she couldn't really until the end of her life she couldn't really go any place else to paint. So she paints what's available to her, and there's little transportation for him, her to be able to go other places, and so she paints this. So this is the mission. Um, excuse me. Yes, it's, it's now the center of a kitchen, uh -huh. and the roof was on it later. It was an outdoor kitchen, but, but it's it's now the center. Yes. That's the name of it, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can, in, in the quadrangle, it's on the that side, the uh, west side of the, of the quadrangle. So mission. That's fine. This is a bishop's peak. It's a, 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 a painting of San Luis Obispo, bishop's peak, uh, which isn't red. I don't know yeah. why she painted it red, but it is a okay. sunrise. Right? Oh, sunrise. Right? <laughs> yeah. So she paints lots of lots of portraits, but she also does lots of landscapes. Um, this is the quest. You can't really see it very well. I'm sorry to say. This is the quest of gray. And so this is at the base of Western Grade. Paints um, it in uh, obviously late 1800s, very early 1900s. And you know the structure? I don't. Yeah, yeah. Do you? No, I don't. I don't know the structure no, because I can't tell. I can't tell where it's painted from. Where the where the we're, we're speculating it might be the Estrada, uh, which is at the foot of Grade, and. This here now, but the side of it, you know, you can see if you know where it was, and I, I still don't, but somewhere just yeah. to the right of Highway 101 is going up to get past the Park. I yeah. think that's it. Yeah, I can't really tell. It's, yeah. We'll have to research that. Absolutely. Awesome. I, I included this one because it's such a different style than her painting. I mean, the other the other paintings that she does are, tend to be sort of representational, and this is much more much more impressionistic. And there are other paintings of hers that are impressionistic as well, but this one I, I thought was really interesting. It, this one is, and I had to find this myself. I was pretty proud of myself. Um, <laughs> Mill House with water wheel. So I could see more than that. And then someone said, I think Dave said, told me, you said, well, that's the Apple Farm. And you just go down the long driveway there in the back, and it's still there, which oh. I had no clue. Pardon? Cool. It's, it's still there. And so you just drive to the back of the Apple House, and there it is. It's still exactly there. So um, so she had that. But this is also a different style of painting. So she, she experimented with all kinds of different um, do you have any idea of the era that that was painted in? I don't. Um, I'm, I'm guessing it was, she's born in 1859, and she, so it would be eight, probably 1890s, 1890s to maybe even early. Well, you know, the creek actually had several mills 
Oh, okay. So it could be anything. Mm, okay. The yeah. Mill is different kinds of mills alone. Mm -hmm. so. Right. I'm not sure our Zoom audience can hear, so you might want to repeat what Marilyn just. Uh, oh, right. Uh, um, there are lots of mills, right? Yes. Along the creek. Along the creek. Water wheels along the creek. Absolutely. And I should have mentioned I was talking about earlier about Pierre that he also had a, he was a, he operated a you know, mill flour mill and he was a carpenter and he was the most important thing of all is the wine I should I can't believe I forgot the wine um, but he brought wine uh, cuttings from France and and planted vineyards and and he also made his own wine barrels and he had a wine cellar which you all know that so. Um, and then this this one she this is the one that's in the back there, and um, I, I included this one because she, in addition to being an artist, she was also a botanist. She also really really um, liked plants and, and and shells and all kinds of things. And if you go through her 150 paintings and pieces of art that she did, there are literally 70. Of shells, I didn't include them because they were like blind block. Like, they all look the same, right? That they weren't. But anyway, so she loved. She loved um, flowers. She loved um, you know, art, all of the stuff. And so she was a botanist as well as a um, an artist. And this is not hers. I, I just wanted to um, to include one of them that was done by her. By one of her friends and Helen Hayes used to paint with her a lot. Um, they would go out and paint and at one point um, she writes a letter to send saying she left some of her supplies at the Adobe and can Pierre send them oh, send them back to her and so um, and then she also said says and the girls that you go have with some of the art supplies and so you can tell that she has a, a, a quiet circle of friends who paint with her. But this is Helen Hayes and she's the one who also published two books. Um, one of them is from Gardens in Mar about Gardens in Maryland. She left, um, she left San Luis Obispo and at some point moved back east and she wrote a book on Gardens in Maryland. And also the Bridges um, in Antietam. So, um, so this is Helen Hayes, who's one of the very close friends. So at the end of her life, the last, the last few years of her life, she and her sister Rose were fortunate enough to travel to Europe. Um, they traveled there in, um, in 1910 uh, and 1911. I wasn't able to figure that out. Um, I think she paid for it because I found a receipt for a sale of a piece of property that she had in 1910. She sold a piece of property for $2,500 for one of her pieces of property. So that may be how she and Rose afforded to go to, um, to England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, this is this is a painting that she did, but she was crossing the Atlantic, called out on the Atlantic, and I I think the um, the ocean is amazing. Yeah. So, and these I'm sorry that you can't see them very well, but these are three three sketches that she did. Um, the top one is of a Welsh miner strike, which I thought was an interesting topic for her to to focus on. Second one is um, in Scotland, and the third one is uh, former British Prime Minister William Gladstone's house. So these are also a different style of art that she did before. And this is a um, and this is a river in uh, Europe that she painted. Twenty five hundred. Really impressed. She was amazing, right? The details are amazing. So anyway, um, so they get back from Europe, and she she lived for another two years after they got back from Europe. And I just wanted to include this this photo because it shows her with a lot of her friends, and she did have an active social life, um, as well as painting and being a botanist, and she was also an assistant librarian um, in uh, San Luis Obispo. So. These are three of her friends, and sadly, she's looking away. The other ones are looking at the camera, or towards the camera, and she's looking away. But she's holding a dog, 
which is um, it's pretty uh, interesting because among um, some of the papers that I found, two different people said that the Dalladays always had dogs. The Dalladays loved dogs. And I thought, they're my kind of people. So, right? So anyway, so um, these are her friends. This is Ethel Jack, who is the youngest daughter of um, R.W. Jack, the Jack House. Um, Jean Lynn, and I couldn't find anything on this. Here's Rose. Um, so Sen, uh, Sen died in 1913, uh, a year or so after she got back from Europe. Um, she had a heart condition apparently, and um, and she died of a heart of heart problems um, in 1913. Rose, meanwhile, lived on until 1943, and she looks to be probably in her 50s here. And you can't really see this, but she has a cat that she's playing, that somebody's playing at her table. So she she remained in the um, adobe with her youngest brother, Paul. So at the end, there were only two living there. Um, and Paul didn't live there for part of the time either, because he apparently went to work for the railroad and he wrote letters to Rose. I did find some letters to Rose in the file. And, um, and so he was always telling her that he was you know, Coalinga or somewhere. He was mostly in California, but he obviously came back uh, because he was the one who lived until 1958 and, and donated the, the adobe to the um, to the historical society. So this is the grave. You can't see it very well, um, Dalladay. And so four Dalladay siblings are buried in the San Luis Cemetery together in the same grave. Um, an interesting combination. Uh, Pierre Jr. The victim of the homicide. Yes, the victim of the homicide. Stan, Rose, and Paul. So what's interesting about this? Where are the other ones, right? Well, they're in the mission cemetery. The father, the mother, and Eliza, who died in the 1890s, are in the mission cemetery. And the other four are in the San Luis Cemetery. Well, it's, it's impossible to know why the difference, except for the fact that maybe the dad did not want um, Epo buried in the grave with his wife and daughter. And so he's buried in the San Luis Cemetery. And so when it comes time for the rest of them, they decide to go with, to go with Epo instead of the parents. I mean, I'm just making this up. I don't have any clothes. But it's pretty interesting, right? Um, so there you have it. This fascinating family, this fascinating woman. Um, I, I, I was trying to think about how I could wrap it up and say something profound, but I think it's just pretty obvious that you look at somebody's life on the surface and it looks pretty simple. And then you go beneath the surface and you find this really interesting person. Um, and so I'm going to continue to do research on her. And um, I'm sure I'll find lots more interesting things about her. So, um, so thank yeah. you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we at this point, I'm going to go ahead and actually grab the camera and turn it around so everybody on Zoom can see all of us here. And if you have a question, uh, we'll start with the live audience and I'll make sure our Zoom audience is also uh, able to participate, but since you guys are here, first of all, go ahead and help yourself to the, the, the water, the lemonade, or the snacks if you want. But in the meantime, I, I've got lots of questions, but I can, I can talk to Kathy anytime. Why don't we start with John in the back? Okay. John, sure. Is it possible that they are privately owned artworks by her in the community? Yeah. I haven't, but that's a great question because this is the other thing. They say that her family saved virtually everything she did. Um, when Paul donated the Adobe, there was all this art there. I mean, folders of art and paintings. There are a lot downstairs. Um, plus, the Jack House. I, I want to go there and see if I can find any. Has anybody seen them there? What 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 what
Oh, I'm not sure how many things. Right. Uh, the house is well preserved. Uh, it's much more elaborate than the adobe. Oh no, I mean the paintings she has there. I don't. I don't remember. Yeah. We have in the audience, by the way, an expert on the Jack family, and that's Marilyn Darnell. <laughs> Don't, don't hide back there. I've got the camera on you now, Marilyn. Wow. Uh, I hope you don't mind because you authored the book of, what's the title of the book? Uh, Anything But Dull. Anything oh, But Dull. And that's interesting because that's what I was thinking when I started this project. This is boring. I mean, no. And it's like, no, no, it's amazing. She was amazing. Um, absolutely. So you're. Anything but boring is in the book? Yes. It's actually the uh, personal letters of oh. Mr. Jeff. Oh, okay. I think I got yeah. it. Yes. You know, they were yes. Yeah. I have a question for you. Sure. Do you happen to know, uh, in the beginning, you showed um, scenes of them being photographed. Mm -hmm. Do you know where that studio was? Was it in San Luis or did they go to San Francisco, which was oh. off of them? I I don't know. That's a great question. Yes, sir. Because the Jacks did too. Okay. Yeah. Um, no clues whatsoever on the on the. Uh, I didn't see any markings or anything on the photos. So, but I can go back and look at them. Um, yeah, it's. I was just blown away by how unusual it was to take your children to dress up your children and take them to have their photos taken. Maybe not in San Francisco, but. But I would say to that, that these were prominent people within the community. Yes. And that's why. Right. And that's why they also stuck together. Because they yeah. had they had that commonality yeah. of being prominent. So when there was, you know, an open house or whatever at the Jack House, they were there. Right. Did you know that at the at the Down the Day, um, there are books that were exchanged between the Jack family and the Delanese. Mm. No, there are this amazing numbers of scientific journals there, though. So wow. I couldn't believe it. So they were so interested in science, they were interested in everything. I mean, they were just as broadly read people, widely read. I mean, absolutely. But it was a little town, so yes. You were saying that Pierre met his wife in New Mexico? No, no, no. His wife's family was from New Mexico. Oh, his wife's And they family. moved here in the 1840s. It's really confusing. There's one book that I read that said they came in the 1830s, but then he, but then somebody was born there in the 1840s in New Mexico, so they had to have come in the 40s. But yeah, so they came in the 40s, and they're fairly well established by the time that, that Pierre is coming you know, down um, to go to Mexico. And they're pretty established, and so he he meets you know meets these established you know, people. Um, and uh, where did he make his money? I think when he came here, he ended up he was looking to make money, but where did he actually? Oh, make Pierre it? Senior. Yes, yeah, Pierre. I could maybe address that, or anybody else who might know more about him. But I believe that he served ten years in the French Foreign Legion in Tahiti. So, you know, he comes out uh, in 1849, uh, and and he's probably a victim of post-traumatic stress disorder. You can imagine how how tough it would have been as a soldier in the French Foreign Legion anywhere but Tahiti. He he got the, he got the great assignment. Yeah. And when he comes, it was pointed out. Dan Krieger actually published an article about this that um, he had nowhere to spend. The, the some teams that he did, was earning in the French Foreign Legion. So when he comes out, he's got a pretty good stash. And even if he doesn't strike an ounce of gold in the fort, which he probably didn't, most of the 49ers didn't, you know, he comes down to San Luis Obispo and he's still got a fairly good stash of, of uh, maybe whatever currency he happened to have it. Uh, you can in. also, though, you can also see possibly that. Because Pierre is not the only only person who marries a really young girl, and this is common, and, and largely common, I think, and I think most people agree, because these people found, you know, found people who had money, and then you marry the daughter, and then you get land, and you get the elite status that these people have, and so a lot of these 
um, foreigners who come to Spanish California to even you know the early American California, they they find these these people already have land and money, and then they find a teenage daughter, and I hate to be so cynical, a teenage <laughs> daughter to marry, but then you figure that they probably it's gonna be hard to find somebody in your own age. They're in their thirties and Pierre was thirty-two when he married his fifteen year old wife. So so anyway, he he, he got the land from the from the, partly from the family he married into and then he began to he began to amass more land. So I mean you probably know more than I do um, about how about how he made his money, but that's what it seemed like to me is he mostly got land and he kept amassing it and then he had wine or wine and stuff. Gave <laughs> Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Speculating. Absolutely. Are there other questions in here? And then we'll go to the yeah, Jason Lynn. Jason. You said you wish you could have met her. I do. So you say how interesting she is. Yes. Her ghost magically appeared, and you got to ask her one question. That question. Whether she was engaged to. <laughs> he's pretty cute. <laughs> but yeah, but he left and she never saw him again. And he died in poverty, I think, right? In a cave or something. That's what I remember reading. But yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know. I mean, she was just, you know, it's so interesting. I mean, you guys are historians and researchers, and you always try to channel the people that you're writing about. You always try to channel them. And sometimes it's easier than other times, you know. Sometimes it seems like they leave more evidence. But women, women when Sam was alive, unless they were reformers or suffragists or you know crusading journalists or you know something, they they didn't leave records, and so you it's hard for you to see who they really were. But it's, it makes it easier because she has all the art thing. Sort of look into her soul from the art, but that just can't be great. Thank you. So I'm going to ask anybody on the Zoom here if they have a question to go ahead and raise their hand. John. Pete, John. Pete, go ahead, Pete. Okay. Um, I looked up all our records today on the French connection in the French collection, which exhibit we did. Yeah. New York Times interview with Leon de Saisac on his way back to France, he stops in New York. He talks about being engaged to sin. Really? Then he also sends a letter to his mom talking about his engagement to sin. And of course, we had the French woman who got her doctorate on De Saisac in California. And she sent us her doctorate thesis in French and it was up to our paid staff to put that into past perfect, get it translated. Whether they did or not, I don't know. But she actually came out here. We gave her a tour of the Daladay. Fantastic woman, fantastic scholar. I just wanted to say that's where we got the information about SASAC and SIN. And I wanted to say another thing is that the Petre gastropods might have something to do with the fact that Sin started collecting shells. Now, because uh, I think, we found, I think the, gas, you, we found I, the Petri gastropods in the closet. Original paintings. Shells. Very, very valuable. Okay, now I just want to let this wonderful speaker know these things. Um, Lewis's diary is fantastic. And Lewis talks about all the different projects he did for his dad. He talks about going out to Port Harford and meeting Sin when she comes back from San Francisco. He talks about all the steelhead that are in all the creeks. And he also talks about, which I found fascinating, that San Luis Obispo celebrated Mexican Independence Day in the 1880s and 1890s. And he talks about going to a huge barbecue on the quest to grade. Um, the mission picture that you, the sketch you had, if you go in the other room, that's called Once Upon a Time in the West, you'll see a picture of a horse 
standing in that adobe wall that's kind of in ruins. And that's what she painted, except the horse isn't in her painting. Um, so, so can I ask you a question? Where, where did you, so where can I find the New York Times article then? You said that. That's what I'm looking for. Cause what I did is in my computer, I looked up everything I've ever downloaded. And then in 2011 is when I wrote about those things. So I'm going to find them for you now. I don't know. Did you go through the vertical file? I went through a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I went through a bunch of stuff downstairs. I did read Lewis's diaries, right. uh, which were, I thought were really interesting. But it was interesting. I, I didn't mention this, that he just took off. <laughs> Nobody no one saw. knows. He Nobody died. Knows. We, we think oh. he died in the mother load. Well, so was a minor. A family that starts with seven children and and one is murdered two two of them leave so there are four left and um and then the one daughter dies so they're, it's, it's an interesting family and they seem so close but but yet there are all these tragedies and things that happen too so and lewis i thought was really interesting i mean i could see john taking off because he murdered his brother but lewis doesn't seem to have any had any reason to take off unless you know no. Uh, a few years ago, we had a visit from one of right. John's uh, great granddaughters, I think, or great great granddaughters. So and there, yeah, there, he was the only one who had children. Um, Pierre Jr. got married, but he got divorced. And then, and I think his wife had children. I didn't know. Yeah, she went back to New York. That's right. Yeah. So this family is fast, they're a fascinating family. I mean, Pierre yeah. is fascinating because he really clearly saw himself as larger than life. And um, people who wrote about him sort of talked about him as though he was larger than life. And you can sort of see him. He looks like he's this big, jolly Frenchman, you know, yeah. all dressed well, up. If, if I may just yeah, say one other, John, one other thing real quick. Yeah. They say Sack didn't necessarily die in poverty. Oh, I thought but he did. He moved, he moved back to his hometown. And there was a nice cave in his hometown. He moved into the cave, but he would come and lecture to people and things like that. And just as you had theories that you couldn't prove, but when you looked at the gravestone was wondering why someone wasn't buried there. Well, we speculated on what happened to De Sasak, and we think he was dosed with psychedelics by his enabler, who is a shaman. You know that famous picture of his enabler? What's his name? Solar? Solar, oh. Solar oh. who was a San Inez Indian. His mother was a famous shaman and even had a grizzly bear for a pet. He was De Sasak's enabler. He went with De Sasak when De Sasak did his digs and things. And uh, yeah, I think De Sasak was shown a little bit of Schumach's cosmology and that might have changed his worldview. But that's I, once again, just speculation. Yeah, we do know unfortunately that he and uh, whatever relationship he had with Sam uh, did not outlive his, uh, his having, when, when he left they, uh, we don't have any record that they corresponded even after that. We do know that he, I think, uh, that Sisak had to settle a debt with Pierre Sr. I think, yeah, he did. He kept the stuff. And, and Pierre Sr. sought the help of the French consulate in getting the debt settled because he thought it was actually the, the responsibility of the French government to have covered the expenses of this archaeological expedition to yeah. the central coast of California. And Alfred Pinard looks like he's the, the partner of the Sesak was uh, obviously uh, kind of a scoundrel, I think. He seems like it, yeah. Well, I'd be interested to see what you've got yeah, later, because I do plan to continue on um, looking into the family, mostly the Sam, but. Well, yeah, I'll try, to, I'll try to figure out where that stuff is. Yeah, if they're engaged, that might make it more interesting. So yeah. And yeah, again, that'd be great. If Thank anybody you. on Zoom would like to ask a question, uh, go ahead and you just unmute yourself if you want to go ahead and ask or, or raise your hand and uh, 
we'll take questions from from the virtual world out there. Yeah, Grace, Grace Yeh, a couple of members of our Educational Outreach Committee. I would add, let me just come around here too, like the camera a little bit maybe. Um, our Carnegie Lectures are, are a project of the, uh, our Educational Outreach Committee for the, uh, for the, for the history of San Francisco. Uh, the Delaney itself is managed by the Delaney Committee, and they're gonna be hosting an event, which would be um, La Fiesta de los Delaney, uh, featuring emphasizing the women of the Gallaudet in October, October 22nd. Sometime either before or shortly after that event, which is a Saturday in late October, um, the, uh, uh, the, the committee hopes to also host a kind of a reprise of this lecture. Uh, so it's about six weeks from now. And uh, I know that Kathy will be, um, uh, you know, she'll have dug up some more stuff, hopefully with cooperation from uh, uh, I know Pete, Pete's going to help her get some of the, the, the missing documents that we we probably have around here. Right now, I want us all to be thinking about too. Our uh, our newest staff member, Brittany, would be here, Brittany Webb, but uh, she's been down all week with uh, uh, having tested positive for COVID on Labor Day. So uh, we're about that time anyway, and uh, so we're, we're once again kind of short staffed at the History Center. We hope Brittany uh, will be back on Monday and uh, we'll be able to help also track down the questions that you, any of us may have about the guidance. I, I also wanted to make sure people knew that this document is available uh, from our website or here at the History Center, the printed copies. You can download your own copy. It is a, uh, uh, a continuation of the series that we've been doing with these Carnegie lectures. We've done, this is the seventh one now already. Um, and uh, we do one every three months, uh, and, and we, we try to feature a local personality or a historic site or a landscape or a building or a story that best is, is uh, talked about by somebody who's done a lot of research, as Kathy has done. And we also then try to compile it and put it into context uh, with a heritage walking tour so you can take these documents and actually take it to the delegate. And, and walk around the Dalladay. If it's open, and if we have our volunteer there, uh, then you can go in and, and, and get a tour of the Dalladay, the inside of the Dalladay. We'll talk about what's available on the interior. We have sections on the Dalladay family, a full page on Sandy Dalladay, um, right here with her self-portrait. Um, another page all about the story of the, the murder, shall we say the, uh, the, the death of, um, of, of Pierre Jr., uh, which for which, by the way, Juan Batista or John, as he was known, the, the second oldest son, third oldest son, mm -hmm. uh, after after Pierre and Luis Pascal, uh, Juan Batista John was uh, the, the one who perpetrated the deed, uh, but he was acquitted by a jury of his peers in San Luis Obispo after a fairly lengthy court trial. Shortly after that. He went off to Mexico. He is the only one of his nine, well, seven surviving adult uh, children of Pierre and Asensio Salazar down there. He is the only one who we know had any issue, any offspring. And as he said, Alma Delade did visit the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the Delade and talk with us. Um, if you go to the Delade and go into the little uh, what we used to have is a bridal pre preparation room. We now have a new bridal preparation room, but this structure, kind of a pop-up structure in the garden, uh, shows uh, has the whole story of of, uh, of Alma, of, uh, of Pierre Jr. and Juan, and of, uh, of Sam Galladay, and a lot about the context of it as well. So uh, we've kind of tried to consolidate some of that information in this walking to a dog. So. Um, we also have a lot of documents at the History Center, including this one, which is a, paper, this is a fairly lengthy, uh, almost a, a doctoral dissertation that discussed all the land transactions involved in the Dalladay estate. And uh, uh, it's a very extensive study. Uh, some of it we know is not accurate, but that's the case with almost any of the historical documents. You have to put, put together a compilation of several of them in order to get a complete picture. And this is much of what the work of people like Kathy and uh, like Jim Gregory, who's also here, 
uh, try to do when they publish uh, as, they, as they do, like Marilyn Darnell, who was here a few minutes ago. Um, is she still here? Yeah, there you are. Uh, in publishing. And by the way, Marilyn has a brand new book out. Mind if I give it a plug here, Marilyn? And Marilyn will be our, uh, our, our uh, an upcoming Carnegie lecture by Marilyn Darnell about her new book, When San Luis Obispo Was Cow Heaven. This is the first time I've seen the book. She just is hot off the press. What, last week? Yesterday. So this is a brand new book we're going to be selling at the bookstore. Um, I got, a, I think I got a speak preview price on it. But what is the cost? About $12? $14.95. OK, inflation. <laughs> but still a bargain. And I'm looking forward to reading it. I will say that both Marilyn and Kathy are really good writers. Jim Gregory is a better writer, I know, than, than, than I am, and um, and these two are, are, are excellent writers, too. Uh, but I, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your version of this book, and we'll have to talk about that as to when it's going to be. We do have a, a, a scheduled speaker for December, and um, in, in, in his name is Olaf Envig. He is the uh, 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 expert on the, the Northwest Ventures of the Scandinavian Navy in the 19th, 18th and 19th century. So um, he's written several books on the subject, and uh, I think it'll be an interesting speaker. It is a little bit out of alignment with what we try to do, featuring local stories, but I know there's going to be a local connection as well, because uh, so many of these people did interact in some way with the Central Coast. So I'm looking forward to that. Meanwhile, I think we'll, uh, unless there are any questions from our Zoom audience for Kathleen, uh, we should let her go get some uh, some dinner, and the rest of you as well. But thanks very much, all. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to leave the Zoom now. Bye, everybody. Oh, I just admitted to a new person. Uh, Terry, I think you were the last person to join, and uh, you'll be. Uh, unfortunately, we're just leaving, but this lecture will be available on our website because uh, it has been recorded and we'll uh, upload it and you can see the whole thing um, in, uh, in a few days. In a few days. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stay on here for a couple of minutes in case there are any last minute questions. Doesn't look like it. Thank you, Consuelo. <laughs> thank you, Sylvan, Joan, Carol. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you at the at the at the Carnegie or at the Dallas in the very near future. Great job, Kathy. This is Sylvan. Really enjoyable. Good. I'll see you. I hope at the EO meeting next week on Wednesday. Yep. Wednesday yeah. Yeah. Sure enough. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Very. Very. Thank you.